Yeah, the military in Hawaii on a given Thursday at uh, 2 p.m. is Think Tech, and our special guest today is Ron Hong. He's director of uh, veteran services uh, in the state of Hawaii. And P.S. Today, if you didn't know, is Veterans Day. Uh, Ron, so nice to have you on, especially today. Jay, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, uh, and and also want to thank you for your Coast Guard service as well. Thank you, Ron. You know. Um, I uh, was working on um, uh, a little movie. That's why we're a minute late here today. Um, and I went on the various uh, stock photo sites to pick off uh, some uh, veterans uh, photos. And um, it was really an experience to do that today because um, I saw so many photos that touched me. Uh, photos, uh, not only of veterans from World War I, but of course, from World War II, um, various branches of service, a bunch of photos of uh, cemeteries in Normandy, for example, but in Arlington also. And uh, reminds me of how profoundly affected I have been whenever I went to a cemetery like that. And some of these photos you will see, I hope, um, um, are also powerful photos of young men Sometimes you don't realize how young, you know, how we send our young men off to war and there's fear in their eyes. Um, there's cynicism in their faces. Um, they're terrified and they're there on the battlefield, not knowing what will happen to them. And there's so many photos like that. You know, there's a library of photos about American fighting men all the way through our history. And we forget how much No, that's so true, Jay. You know, I mean, uh, some of the things that uh, that you have probably interviewed so many people and uh, we touch a lot of veterans lives is transgenerational. Uh, I mean, you, you can't get charged up enough when you see these veterans who didn't ask for anything, but went out there to go serve their country. Many gave their lives. Many came back and uh, their lives were changed. You know, some had to fight wars on two different fronts. It's just an amazing kind of thing that you have to go through. And um, like you and many others, we've got many family members. We have friends. We got people that are touched by this by this Veterans Day. And it always is very kind of melancholy for all of us because of the fact that, like you said, uh, I was earlier with uh, General Hara and General Logan and our Command Sergeant Major in, in the cemetery, um, Hawaii State Veterans Cemetery, along with Rob Lee, our uh, our cemetery operations manager, just to lay a simple wreath on behalf of uh, the state. Now, most people think, you know, of course, Veterans Day is for the living, but we never forget, we never forget, just like what you said earlier, Jay, about those who sacrifice so very much because that's what we have today. And we cannot forget those who are still serving in harm's way and supporting uh, the so many different missions that are out there, whether it be Guard, Reserve, or, or active duty members. So the tradition is at um, 11 minutes after two, yep. and we happen to have two o'clock for the show, you and me, Ron. So it's uh, it could not be more appropriate. And 11 minutes after, it's about that now. Uh, we take a couple of minutes of silence, and uh, our engineer, Eric Kalander, has a, has a graphic which we'll hold on the screen for those two minutes, and you and I can both think those thoughts, and maybe our audience can too. So in, in accordance with the tradition that has existed since World War I, um, we're, we're going to take two minutes to think about that, starting right now.
about it, Ron. <clears throat> um, powerful stuff, and uh, we have we have more graphics, which we hopefully will be able to show later in this program. But I do want to take a moment and um, talk to you about the veterans in Hawaii. Now, we know that war has changed. Um, life in the service has changed. Life and death in the service has changed. And the welcome home for veterans certainly has changed. It wasn't only we gave up the draft, um, which I, I always thought was a benefit for the country myself, but um, it, wasn't always, it, it wasn't only that that has changed over the past few decades. Uh, it's everything. It's it's war. It's politics. It's geopolitical engagement, uh, and of course, it's life in the service, life on the battlefield, and the nature of the battlefield itself. So you see that as the director of uh, veteran service, you see them, may I say, coming home. How has it changed? What is it like to see them coming home? That's a it's a great question, Jay. You know, it's it's such a different era that we live in. Uh, my dad was a Vietnam era veteran. Uh, he had to take off his uniform in the aircraft when he landed in San Diego uh, because there were some riders at the at the airport that were going to pelt him. And so uh, took his took his uniform off and put his civilian clothes on. That's one small problem. He had this huge green duffel bag when he was coming down the, the air stairs. It didn't make a difference anyway, you know, but those Vietnam veterans, you know, we stood on the, their, their shoulders and like the Korean War veterans, like the World War II veterans, you know, the greatest generation. Uh, there's just so many people now the same with our global war and terrorism, you know, veterans. And, and one of the big dynamic things, and you've seen this, Jay, I mean, you've talked to many people. When our folks have gone to Vietnam or they've gone to Korea, a lot of times it's a single tour. It can be a 12 month, it can be an 18 month. And our global war on terrorism and our Gulf War veterans have gone back two, three, some as many as five and six times with those kind of experiences, you know, and it's just incredible, you know, and, and the, the, the health care requirements and the way they triage and the way they do um, the, uh, uh, the support for those veterans, I should say military members, it's just incredible. I think it was less than a 50 percent. Um, survivability rate when you come out of Vietnam, maybe two, two and a half weeks, uh, you know, if you're even lucky to do that, you know, now with the Gulf War and our, our, our efforts in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, and it's almost like 90, 95%. But a lot of these veterans are surviving with a lot of different ailments when they've come back from uh, so many, you know, different uh, excursions that they had to go on. You know, every one of these revolutions brings up something brand new, you know, with our police force, the law enforcers, God bless them. You know, when they got to go out and do things, they stand down if they have to pull their weapon. What does is, what is a military member when they go on patrol do? Well, they go back and they uh, they regroup. And they go back out on patrol the next night, the night next, the following night, until they get, keep getting that mission done. And so th a, it's a huge difference what we see out there. So now that crosses over to claims, Jay, and, and you're right. You're absolutely right. Now you see where these claims are now anywhere from double digits to, to you know different types of musculoskeletal there are tbi a tr a traumatic brain injury post-traumatic stress it, it, it runs the entire gamut because our folks are exposed to so much uh, the big one of course now is the exposure to toxic uh, materials or the burn pits and other related things that are going on you know um, of course we still can't forget the other generational folks our vietnam veterans that first came in this job there were only eight presumptive ailments. You talk about change, eight presumptive ailments for Agent Orange. We're up to 17 today. And now we have the Blue Water Navy. I know you've probably done segments on that. And now can partake of being able to get uh, claims where for decades they've been denied and denied and denied. So there have been a, a lot of upheaval. Can more be done? There is more coming. There's no doubt about that, especially for caregivers and for other related uh, survivors uh, that have to uh, support uh, the living veteran. Yeah, well, what troubles me um, over the past, uh, over my observation of this, which is, you know, I got out of the service in 1971, um, is that um, when they come home, 
Uh, although there are military and uh, veterans organizations dedicated to support them, the public, as in the case of your father, may not support them at all or know or understand or appreciate that they put their life in harm's way uh, to preserve this country. And this country is what sustains all of us. We forget that. We forget how critical it is to have a country. Uh, and maybe we think that uh, countries go by themselves and you don't have to do anything to have the benefit of a country, a, a democratic society like this, but you do. And one of the things you have to do is you have to defend it. And you have to have sovereignty and you have to preserve its borders. You have to preserve its integrity. You have to preserve its place in the, in the global order. And um, that's what the military is there to do for our security and our quality of life and, and a very fundamental level. So what troubles me is when they come back, they have experiences like your father. And, and I know about experiences like that in the Vietnam time, and I'm sure it happens now. And when you have a volunteer force, which is less than a million altogether, you know, uh, you, you have people who have no clue back in the civilian community what goes on. They don't know what happens in the theater of war. They have no idea what it's like to be in the skin of a trooper. They have no idea um, about the, the risks, dangers, and and the disabilities and deaths that result from being in a theater of war. So part of it is to educate them. Um, part of it is to make it clear that these people are serving us and their service to, to the nation is service to every single one of us. Um, and so credit goes out to you and the veterans organizations all around the country um, to appreciate that to publicize that, to, you know, educate people about that. And of course, to take care of the veterans. And there have been times, I'm sure you can tell me about it, where veterans, uh, you know, organizations in government were not really caring for veterans. You've already alluded to that. And that's more than tragic. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a violation of, of an oath, of a promise that we, that we must keep to preserve and protect and help our veterans return. Um, so I guess the question is, uh, are we doing that now? You talked about the increase in, you know, in um, line item uh, disabilities and handicaps and ailments uh, that uh, veterans may have when they come back and greater coverage under the veterans claims procedure. But, you know, <clears throat> what about all those veterans who have um, experienced trauma and have, um, uh, PT, PTS, I've heard it referred to now instead of PTSD, because a lot of veterans don't want to call it a disorder. It's just a kind of condition. So they call it PTS now. Um, and also, the, you know, the problem about reentering the economy, um, finding housing, getting married, having kids, having that white picket fence they dream about while they're on the battlefield. Um, what about that? Are they getting that or uh, is, are there obstacles for them to get that these days right now? You, you bring up a very good point about the fact that, you know, uh, with this transition assistance program, when I went through it, you know, it was like a three day optional kind of thing. Now they're trying to get our military members anywhere from six to a year out to start planning ahead. So by the time they leave the service, they already probably have their disability claims in the system. There's already a rating, potentially compensation ready for them. And they've already done the wraparound services with the, the jobs, you know, looking at all the other, looking at veteran friendly employers, education's already set up for them. So, so there's none of this, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm by myself, uh, I've lost my teammates. I, I don't have anybody around me as a support network like I had in the military. So I, I see some of that really happening a lot better. And you're right about the veteran service organizations, the state and other folks that partake in things now. We recognize that and we wanna make sure that in, if, if we do anything right, we're, we're ahead of that power curve. Because if we do those kind of things, we'll help those others. And you know how that works? Because when you help one veteran with that kind of help, that veteran will start spreading that word to their other uh, you know, battle mates, their other uh, shipmates, there are other wingmen, and that, that's how they start working out all those other details like that. And that's how that work gets done, you know. You know, one veteran taking care of another veteran. As many things as the government tries to do and the community organizations, I'm going to tell you what, Jay, it, it's going to be that veteran 
saying, you know, follow me. I'm going to get you the help that you need. And you're coming, you're coming with me now. You're going to come see the state. You'll see the VSO. You can come see the VA. And we're getting you registered today. And I've seen a lot of that happening. Well, you know, to the extent that people don't understand, they don't participate, they, they don't care about, uh, the, you know, the life of the veteran, either in the service or out. Um, the veterans themselves understand. They, they, form, they form a community. They are a community. And you're there to enable, encourage that community, um, be a rallying point for that community, which is a, a, great, a great function. I'm sure that touches you as it does me. Um, but I wonder how that works because, you know, they come back, they have problems, uh, they have medical problems, they have psychological problems, uh, they have economic problems for sure. They have social problems in terms of dealing with people who don't understand. Um, and so query, what role does that community play? How can you bring them into the community, be sure they're getting the benefit of what you're talking about? And how can you bring the community to them? Uh, to you know, envelop their lives uh, to improve their self, you know, self image and and their you know their their quality of life every day, and so and what happens when somebody loses touch with that community? What's the risk? What's the damage? I'm sure you see a lot of cases where that happens, where it separates, and the individual veteran returning doesn't have the connection, and he pays a price. We all pay a price if he doesn't reconnect. Can you talk about it? Yeah, well, you know, it's a community effort, Jay. You hit on a lot of important points, uh, but also remember now, and, we, and you know this, the veteran also has a responsibility as well. I, I can't tell you how often we've gone out there and we have all these services, we're, we're helping them do a step up, we're giving them all these resources and somehow, some way the veteran will not embrace that for whatever reason, you know? They're so used to the, the type of life that they're living in, and uh, it's just hard to have that breakaway with them until you can find something in that wheelhouse of theirs that makes sense, that clicks, that gets them to do the help that they need. You know, we had a, an individual, I, I don't want to go into all the details to discuss anything that I might, but uh, Mangle Man was his name over on, on the Windward side. And our, our team members from uh, the uh, homeless program over at the VA, uh, the Veterans Benefits Administration, healthcare folks went out and, and he had come up on some type of a big article and uh, he wasn't getting the help and the support that he needed. And, and folks just said, you know, we're gonna go help this individual. And they made it an effort and many people went out there directly to make sure that individual needed the help. And apparently way back when, and just kind of like what you said, Jay, they weren't getting the help that, that, they, that, that, that they needed. And I will tell you, the VA people have said this many times, it was all about the institution five, 10 years ago. It's about the VA institution. Now it's, it's very much veteran centric. It's about what the veterans, you know, you can do all these great things, but if the veteran doesn't feel like they're getting taken care of, they're getting help, it's not gonna make a difference. And that one individual got connected right away. That one individual got connected with wraparound services and uh, he was so very grateful for somebody that just simply cared. Somebody just, just simply went above and beyond what they would normally do just to say, you know what, you're not going to do this alone. We're going to go ahead and help you get there. And that's what that team did. And that's what we should be doing each and every time we have an issue like that. Now, some require a lot more with mental health issues and related things, but we have the specialists. We have the right people. We got the professionals. We just need to make sure that they get connected to them. And again, the veteran, we've got to make sure we can get the veteran to be receptive to receiving the help and the health care that they need. Yeah, I mean, the worst thing is uh, when they kind of separate, not only from the uh, you know veterans community and uh, the military in general, the military community, if you will, um, and then they separate from society in general, yep. and they wind up alone um, in a homeless camp, uh, and that's more tragic than I than I can explain. I, I it just touches all of us when we see that happening. Here's somebody who put his life on the line, protect the country, and what in the world is a, co a country doing for him that he should be uh, sleeping on the sidewalk? That's just intolerable. Um, so what, tell, tell me about your programs and how do you do the outreach? How do you connect? How do you provide these services? Um, how do you speak to them and engage with them? Tell me about your programs. 
So, you know, a lot of the things that we do, um, a lot of times it's by word of mouth, but we also have a lot of different connectivity points. So for example, the State Advisory Board on Veterans Services is made up of veterans uh, in various regions throughout the, throughout the state. We got representatives on Kauai and uh, Hilo and Kona and uh, Maui. And uh, they also help support some of the other smaller areas like in Maui and Lanai as well, of course here in Oahu. And they're kind of the conduit that ties in a lot of the things that are happening with veterans very much in those regions and those city and counties and those, those townships. They in turn tie into the, the, the veteran consuls. So in each and every area. So we have a veterans consul here on Oahu called the Oahu Veterans Consul. That's 45 service organizations that meet every single month, the fourth Saturday. There's a one on Kauai, at the Kauai Veterans Council. There's a Maui Veterans Council that also meets. There's a West Hawaii Veterans Council that meets out there. And there's also an East Hawaii one on the Big Island that's coming together. And the Molokai also has their own as well. So the connectivity points are all there to be able to get the help that they need. And then we just try to do the very best that we can to provide the outreach services that they're specifically looking for. If they need help on claims, you know, submissions, if they need help on just registering to get a, a veteran health card to get into the VA, uh, if they just wanted to, hey, everybody's refinancing today. Why aren't you taking advantage of the low VA home loan guarantees that, that are out there, you know, and uh, here's how you can get that kind of help. Why aren't you using your GI education bill? The post 11 GI bill is transferable to your family members. And you know, my dad went to school on the, the GI bill out of Vietnam. He got his degree, became a teacher. You know, what, what is going on out here? So a, a lot of times it's just a matter of where are we at? We just did a, a talk story, you know, with the Kauai folks yesterday. And, um, you know, we we're hoping to get more people involved. Uh, about a month and a half, well, maybe June to July, uh, there was a two-hour session each week. We did a partnership with a couple of uh, very prominent uh, folks to do a, a virtual veteran summit. And our last uh, speaker uh, was Jessica Lynch. You know, she was out of Iraq, uh, the Iraq campaign. She got captured and injured. I remember eventually. she was a national, a national yeah. news item for sure. Yeah. Uh, folks came and saved her. Well, she was the last keynote at the end. And, and part of the thing was to talk about what's happening with our women veterans, you know, the fastest demographic that's out there. We do have a new, uh, uh, well, I say a new approach to the, the Women's Veterans State sub, Subcommittee that started. We have uh, a, a full-time uh, Hawaii uh, National Guard, Army National Guard uh, 06, Pam Ellison, who's running that particular program. She's got folks that she's putting together right now. About three or four years ago, they had uh, women's, State Veterans Summit, you know, that were done, that, that several of them were on the neighbor islands. And that's how you educate. That's how you get the word out. That's how you outreach. That's how you connect. That's how you develop the kind of things that you need to do out there. You know, we got tie-ins with the Veterans, uh, the veterans uh, Employment Training System with the Department of Labor. You know, they're bringing the job requirements. They look for veteran-friendly employers that really want to hire veterans. And, you know, and then we see all these different little things. We were on the state task force uh, that dealt with a lot of other things that uh, are trying to help bring in some other new um, uh, pieces of uh, community partners uh, like ARP and other related things that just do some amazing work to help veterans like what you're doing, Jay, to uh, put out things on think well, tech, because I see a lot of things that you're doing to help get the word out about, you know, the veteran plight and the issues that are out there. So all these things kind of all add up, you know, and uh, we, we, we can't do it by ourselves. We can't do it with a single entity. It's a multi-ship formation. Everybody's got to go out there and nobody is satisfied with any of the work in, that we're doing now because we know we got a lot more work ahead of us. You know, it's so interesting that, um, you know, talk about people who have been assigned um, to Afghanistan um, over, over the years. And when they finish one tour, they go back yeah. uh, and maybe again. And that's voluntary. That's, that's not because they're ordered back five times, it's because they want to. And um, there, you know what it is though? I like to raise this, this thought with you. They're kind of, they're veterans who are still in the service. <laughs> They're veterans of a given campaign. Um, they don't have to go back to that campaign, but they do go back. And, and my question is, can you help me understand why? 
Uh, can you help me understand this whole notion of, of a veteran being a veteran who is still on active duty? You know, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, the camaraderie, um, the love and the passion they have uh, for their battle buddies and for the things that they do, Jay. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's just incredible, the, the sacrifice that folks do. They see a mission that is that may not have been completed to the, to the requirements and the objectives that needed to be done. And we're not used to, you know, the United States military does not come in second place. You know, it, that doesn't work. So when, so when we go out there, we go out, we take care of the business that needs to be done. We need, we need to take care of all of the objectives, all of the goals that need to be done. And I think many times people are just so, they have so much heart to make sure that if we have still work that needs to be done in some of those regions, and I've, we have battle buddies, we have people out there in those regions, and then not only that, but you saw it happen in the uh, the exit from Afghanistan. We had a lot of people that we've gotten to know, interpreters, people that work with the State Department, you know, people that gave up their lives and probably gave up uh, lives of their family members to help the U.S. while they were in that occupied country out there you know i mean so it, it's a, it's very emotional it, it's tied to strong bonds and strong relationships and that's what the military does you know that from your own service you probably still keep in contact with your coast guard mates and the folks that are out there i know, you know I, there's a certain purity there yeah those relationships are you know yeah. really lifelong and they're they're pure Absolutely. Uh, but i want to go back to something you talked about a minute ago which i think is critical and we need to talk about it and that is jobs. In my firm, my law firm over the years, we always favored veterans um, because we found that in general, they were quite competent. They would follow through. You know, that's the big test. Are you going to do what I've asked you to do and finish the job? And veterans, you know, have training in that and they are like that as a group. Um, and so we always felt they were good hires, uh, predictably good employees. <clears throat> but, um, you know, actually, uh, I must say there weren't enough of them. I wish there had been more that knocked on our door. Um, and I wonder if uh, they're being connected for these jobs, and especially in the time of COVID, right? So the job market is all skitter. Um, and sometimes there are too many jobs and too few applicants, and sometimes just the other way. Training is important. Um, but I, I feel, as I mentioned, that veterans make great employees. And so the question is, are they getting the jobs they need to get? What can we do to make sure they get jobs that are appropriate to their skills, their experience, um, and to give them the kind of life that they should have um, on returning from military service? Now, there, you, know, you know, there are special considerations for veterans with preference points, applying for federal jobs. You know, the VA has been on a, a strong... Uh, push to hire more veterans in the VA to be able to do certain things. The Department of Labor vets, you know, they run the numbers pretty much uh, monthly. They take a look at the veteran unemployment rates in comparative to what's happening with the populace for the state and national levels. And they try to direct that. They have in the state workforce development program, special advisory committees and uh, members that help uh, disabled veterans look for job employments and 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 get the get the things that they need to, to get moving so if if the veteran needs help in the job we always tell them let's use these resources let us help you navigate to those resources and it may have to be for you to just get your just get into a, a job now it may not be the number one number two job you're looking for but start something now because that will build the momentum and exactly what you just said jay it's going to take over. They're going to come back. They're going to rehone again. And, and, you know, Jay, we're biased, right? Because we're military members, right? When you talked about hiring some of the best and the brightest and those who are motivated and disciplined, but that's what's going to shine through. Every time they go into job interviews, every time they go through the things that they need to go through, you know, and I know a lot of the veteran uh, friendly employers understand about what veterans have, have to go through. And a lot of them understand that, Hey, you know, they've been through so much. But I want to try it. Plus, they also had some special, um, I want to say, uh, 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 employment credits when you hire a, a disabled veteran 
there's a certain amount of credit that you get for that. And I'm talking money that goes to the employer as well as just hiring a veteran uh, in general. So I think those credits are still available today. So not only does it pay to hire a veteran, but like you said, Jay, and I'm in total agreement with you, you get the best and the brightest, the most disciplined. These are folks that are used to making the mission work. They will find a way to help support that employer and do right by them, you know? And uh, again, they, all they need is just a chance, just a chance to get in the door and to show what they're made of. You know, and, and we see that often because I know one of our one of our things in our this state advisory board, you know, that we have every month, we look at those rates. And right now, the rates for I think veterans uh, is, is doing very really well. We're lower with a lower veteran employment unemployment rate than we are with the populace right now. I think in Hawaii and, oh, and, and that's good to hear. So and that just came out within the last couple of weeks when they beefed that. So, you know, that that tells me that the community and the partners that are involved with all that, the employers, but more importantly, the veterans are still seeking and they're finding and they're getting into programs that uh, is going to help them now until they can find the ideal job that they're always looking for, you know? Well, you know, we're almost out of time, uh, regrettably, because I don't, you know, I, I have more I'd like to talk to you about. But I want to I want to end on this note. Um, the government has and should have substantial and generous programs for veterans. They defend our nation. We call on them to put their lives on the line. Uh, and there's no question that we owe them a, a tremendous debt, every single one of them. And that all of us should appreciate that they are helping us uh, in our daily lives. Um, so we have government programs and, you know, as we, we talked about, the government programs have changed. Uh, maybe uh, to some extent it's political. It's uh, maybe sometimes bureaucratic. Who knows what? Um, sometimes they're better. Sometimes they're not. Um, but they, they are what we rely on, you know, to help to help our veterans. We want those programs to be the best they can be always. But the other side of that is this problem that people don't know, don't understand, don't care what happens to the veterans. Um, and it seems to me that we have to remind people about that because uh, left to their own devices, uh, they will not care. So I wanna offer you a minute to talk to those people. I would like you to tell them what they, what they should think about here. Uh, what should be their way of looking at it in terms of dealing with the veterans who are going back into our community who are you know, such an important part of our, our national process, our, our national, our nation, our nation. What would you say Thanks. to those people? Well, thanks, Jay. And I, I would just tell them very plain and simple. Uh, these are your sons. These are your daughters. These are your friends. These are your community members. These are your neighbors. These are people in the community that were willing to give up their life. Like you said, pay the greatest debt with their life to help this country move forward. A lot of them have gone forward and served uh, uh, commendably on active duty in war campaigns. Many of them have uh, transitioned into guard and reserve duty, doing humanitarian and disaster relief kind of things. You know, look at the National Guard here. They're all over. They're in the airports. They're doing COVID testing. You know, it's just incredible what General Howard and the, the team members have to do out here. They're out there on the DLIR, the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations, trying to do unemployment claims and things, you know? That's what, that's what our military does. They're so diverse. These are incredible men and women who are out there that are just giving their all every single day. And the, our community, our state and our nation, you know, we're obligated. You know, we, we have a, a sacred trust uh, to go back and make sure that those individuals are taken care of. You know, those are, again, there are sons, there are daughters, they're, they're family members, everyone that we serve, we serve the entire populace. And so we would lay down our lives, you know, for, for, for anyone, for the ideals of, of this great democracy that we live in. That's what the oath that we took, you know, and to make sure that we can do those things. So when you hire a veteran, you, you, if you're if you're thinking that you know maybe you're going to get someone that has all these issues that come with them, that that's 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 understandable. 
but remember why you're doing what you're doing. You're trying to give that veteran an opportunity to get a, a start. You're trying to give that veteran an opportunity to, 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 to show how much a state and a nation and a community appreciates their service. Again, like you said, less than 1%. You know, there's not too many of them out there. It's shrinking every day. And uh, we owe them all great debt. And we owe those who are serving today to know that whatever's happened to those, like the Vietnam veterans, the Korean War veterans, World War II veterans, and now the, 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 the global war and terrorism veterans, that they have still have a future. It's going to be better when you leave the system. When you separate and you retire, these things are going to get worked out. I know for me, they were much better than what my dad had when he left the service. Yeah, yeah. sure. Ron Hahn, Director of Veteran Services in Hawaii, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for this special conversation on this special day, Veterans Day 2011. Thank you so much, Ron. It's been an honor, Jay. Thank you so much for all you do as well. Aloha. Aloha.